I'm so thankful for his friendship. And I don't know if you noticed last uh, Saturday, he was just walking around serving everybody. So it was amazing to have, um, have a brother like him to help us on our special day. He came up to our table and was like, oh, do you need anything? Do you need anything? It was, it was amazing. So thank you, Pastor Sam, for the servant that you are. You know, sometimes when you think of this whole light and darkness things, that's light. Darkness over here. And I just look at myself as like, I'm assuming that his clapping is the old Tibetan ritual to warn off evil, right? <laughs> oh, sometimes I have no idea what am I doing. So today I've been tasked with this task to speak with you about anger. For some odd reason, Pastor Leung always managed to pick the things that is just most vulnerable into my spiritual growth. And today's is a um, topic. It's called anger management. So when we look into our sermon topic, I was like, why would I get picked these topics? I think with all the rest of this Jesus is teaching about eye for an eye, oath, divorce, adultery, I feel like I'm more compelled. But somehow I landed on this whole thing about anger and loving your enemy. In reality, this is two things that I am most vulnerable with. I have to make a several confessions. Today I want to use more example about myself. It's because I need to punch myself in the gut just to know that uh, I can trust this Jesus. Deep down, I'm probably the most angriest person you would know. I'm always angry. I mean, people look at Hulk as like, I think I'm, I think I'm got that banner in me. Um, and there's a lot of things in the world to be angry about. Like sometimes I think I challenge myself. It's like I'm supposed to be a pastor. I'm supposed to be happy and jeery and, and kind. I, I, I'll give you an example. One time I was, uh, this is when my daughter was about three years old. We would just get the car seat settled. We are going out for a drive. And then just for no reason, pull up next to me, there is a group of girls. And I think they were pounding the windows, getting us attention. I mean, they're driving, so they're not that little. So they finally got our attentions. And next thing you know, it's all three of them was out there making racist remark. They were making racist remark. And then I went from zero to white hot rage. If it wasn't for my daughter to be there, I, I want to not park my car and have a conversation with him. I want to do more. And then when I think about the world, it is truly is the same thing. It's very angry. I'll give you another example. Last Wednesday, I had a root canal. Not fun. I was laying there feeling vulnerable, and I was shaking. In case you didn't know, I'm terrified of dentists. I'm sitting there, literally, I cannot help but shaking. And guess what? My dentist says that you should pray, and then he prayed for me. I think, oh, thank you, but I can't stop shaking. And next thing you know, when he started operating with me, he started grinding away my teeth, and then he said, like, he's looking at me, he's annoyed. I said, are you still shaking? And he said to me, you're a pastor. You should have more faith. I was like, bro, I have faith in Jesus. You are a dentist. But he got so mad at me, he walked out for 10 minutes. I'm here it's just like I can taste the chunky stuff in my mouth. And the, even the digenesis is like, he'll be right back. I was like, and then you have the things in my mouth. I was like, wow, this, everyone is angry. And if you're here in last Friday night's fellowship group, you can learn to be very angry with yourself. It's like just watching them for 30 minutes. <laughs> you have children laughter and going to Yosemite. We got the fire department coming. You could be very angry with yourself. Anger is so intuitive part of us. So today we want to kind of talk about these issues of anger. Is anger bad? All anger bad? What is how we're going to deal with this? How is the gospel answer to these questions of anger? How is the church dealing with a society that is filled with anger? Anger triggering. You heard that word. So we want to talk about this. But you know, like when most of the time when you're talking about something, you're hearing a podcast, you're looking at the teacher, he's teaching you some idea, especially something is so primal as anger. We want to hear who is it that's speaking. You want to hear that it is what degree? Are you a psychiatrist? Are you a doctor? So today, the person who is calling out this anger, his name is Jesus Christ. He was born 2,000 years ago, is wandering in the world of Nazareth, and he's teaching all these things. But if you read it in Matthew 7, 
He knew what he's talking about. More terrified of those is when he calls it out. He didn't call it out the outcome of anger. He calls it out the heart of it. That we want to look at this today. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm clicking wrong. Pardon me. Clicker does not. Okay, am I clicking or are you clicking? Okay, all right. So where do we get started? Well, of course, you know, Jesus is the son of God, at least is what he proclaimed to be. Now, let me preach it, okay, so I hope I can sell you to this idea. So when we're looking at these gospel idea, we want to see where this is coming from. Of course, this is God's story. So a long time ago, God said that he had corrected, the, I created the world. I was the light to come into this darkness. And not only there was a darkness, I see that there is a need for a family. So there is this upon God that in the Garden of Eden, he created a place that's suitable and it's good for his children. Yet he walked alongside, he loved them, he cultivated them, he be with them, he nourished them. And then that is said, you got to go forth and subdue this chaos. Because out there is not only messes, it's all that people was living by the desire of the fish or the flesh, or the desire. They are there to conquer each other, to cannibalizing each other, to rule over each other in fears and his might and his anger. But he said that because I give you this hope, because I am with you, you are going out there to testify this. And he called. But his children somehow didn't lift up. They fell to the same doubt that is the father is good and that they transgressed it. But God didn't stop. He was faithful. And then out from that, Noah, out from that, Moses, out from that, Abraham. To the point that Abraham said that, that I'm going to make your name great. Your children will be vast. But yet he only got one. But it's the odd things that today when we look upon ourselves, we are the children of Abraham. That he's promised. So Matthew is writing about this as he is dawning to himself. It is not a single incident. And another thing I'm trying to sell you up here is that the Bible is not a bunch of loosely collected story, but it's a cohesive story pointing to the man of Jesus. I'm sure that when Matthew is writing about this, he's just as tripped out as we are today. How can that be? Why is this? But when he realized the man in front of him who he collected taxes and walk alongside he was the one the prophet has been talking about. Micah, Jeremiah, Isaiah. These are my forefathers. These are the people who are telling us that we need to turn back from him. Yet he is right here in front of me. He's telling it to the next generation of believers. Yet this is the king. He's bringing into our kingdom that we don't want, but yet we necessary. But the problem of this, this kingdom is because we call it the light. Now, we use this word lightly, or actually very sincerely, but not in the tone of accusation. Not that people doesn't believe, it, believe in Jesus, that you're in darkness. Because the light is where life is. But in the world, the flesh is exactly what it is saying. But there is a problem. Light is so determined that the life will flourish from you. But darkness is saying that we are adamant about absorbing as much people as possible. The funny thing is, is darkness needs you. But you have to recognize that you need the light. So here we're in this warfare. A necessary, a necessary contention because Jesus even said that you're going to be salt and light to be a group of people to testify. This is the belief. This is the system. Not just a good will, not a spiritual leader, but it is the Lord, the Messiah. He's calling upon and say that we've got to be salt and light because the world is corrupted. Think about it. If you live by all your own desire and you have unlimited power, what will you be? That's why Superman is in the comic. When someone who has absolute power to come and serve, that's absurd. That's why Superman is wearing his underwear on the outside. To remind us the absurdity of this, but more absurd the king of the universe got hung on the cross to proclaim his victory. That's why we are to be salt and light. We are to believe in him by faith, to lift out the teaching that he has in us, this new law that we're going to live out there. 
to stop this corruption of desire over desire. Then also to give people purpose. This is not that this is just a TED talk, a good saying, but this is the gospel. This is the truth. This is the way we have life, and life will flourish from this life. And then here's Jesus is sitting on top of the hill. He's beginning his teaching. He's called upon this new people of God. It's like good news of the kingdom. But only those who are broken in spirit, only those who have known what mourning means, only know that people have seen, have experienced power, and their power only bring travesty. Only those who want to be merciful have recognized that there is a thirst and hunger for a new kind of righteousness, an absolute righteousness, a righteousness that's related to you. Those who have become pure-hearted, you'll never be pure-hearted. Pure-hearted in here, I'll give it to you short, is the single-minded that's seeking Jesus. No two-heartedness, pure heart. You're looking at it, focus, it is it. And you'll become a peacemaker. And the world will pers persecute you because the world itself to survive, it needs this darkness. It needs you to be agreement with this darkness. But yet you bring the opposite of it. Your healing and your power come from a humility. The world will hate you. These are the law of the word. So when Jesus is coming in here today, when he starts teaching about this, he is starting from the angle of the law. Not only the law of this world, the interpretations of a law, and how you see God's law it is. Let me read it to you. You have heard this, that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murder will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who said to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who said, you fool, you be in dangers of the fires of hell. Therefore... If you're offering your gifts at the altar and there is, remember that there's your brother and sister has something against you, leave your gifts there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gifts. Settle your matter quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still on together on the way. Or your adversary might hand you over to the judge and the judge might hand you over to the officer and you might be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you pay this last penalty, last penny. What a loaded word. What are you talking about, Jesus? So we're first coming off from the law. Every one of you have a law in your heart. Everyone does. Every law does. But we really don't understand what law is about. Like when you're little, I say don't run with scissors. Not that I don't think that you shouldn't be running with scissors, but it's ultimately running with scissors will hurt you. But as a parent, you know that running with scissors, if after you get hurt, your suffering causes a trauma in my heart. Really does. God's law, it is to preserve the relationship between you and him. Because it is in him that you have life. It is in him that you have that flourishing. It is in him that you have the security. Apart from him... It's not good. So the point of the law is to preserve this relationship. But yet, people have twisted these laws. You have heard eye for an eye, right? Anyone have heard of this? I have gotten into a long time ago, I got into a, 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 a disagreement, a heated disagreement. Because one of my kids was getting bullied. And there are some guys coming in here who's teaching my kids. It's like, eye for an eye, man. So you should go out there and learn some karate and chop him in the eye. But what that point of eye for an eye, tooth or a tooth is, is we even when you're out there seeking this equalizing, this, this, this transgression I've done for you, put the limitations on it. But be careful because all of us go out there, want to go out there to claim this eye for an eye. We in, in the process, we may knock out a few tooth. Jesus is calling out this. This meant for the law. It's also said in here is, is that do not murder. It's actually, I remind you, there's the sixth commandment out of the tenth commandment. But it's also saying that if you, by the time you get to the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, when you're contemplating murder, you really have forego the first six. It's almost a redundancy, a layer. If you forget that I am a God, that I have made the image bearers, if you have made an idol like your anger, your lust, your righteousness, your own right and wrong, you have fallen behind. 
And then when you have covet, when you have see that you can proclaim this right and wrong into your own hands and become your own creator, become your own judge, watch out. Because next thing you know, you can kill. Jesus is calling this out. Watch out. But the truth is the world is actually really twisted. For those of you younger, I don't know if you follow the news or not. I limit myself for only a couple of minutes, like 10 minutes of news, because I get irate. Any of you young people have in high school talk about the um, Congress hearing with the tweeter executive? And it's just the audacity of these people. Yes, you are a technological leader. You are good at technology. But why are you pronouncing right and wrong? And one argument is between the Supreme Court justice is actually with the lawyer of Twitter. He's talking about why ISIS is, should be on it, why they can actually um, s reject or ghost ban certain group, Christian groups to be most. Why can you do that? You can be angry. Recently, there is a thing in Southern California. There's a Vietnamese lady who's been robbed. And in this process of robbery, she was paralyzed. But the person was jeering and just, justing, uh, uh, jeering and cheering in and, and, and jail. He's like, he said something, call her a B name. She got GoFundMe. There's no law. And they're talking about lowering his bond and letting him out. He paralyzed someone. We're looking at law. Law today, it doesn't seem like it's pointing us anywhere to righteousness. It's pointing us into darkness. Law is supposed to set things right, to put a boundary. You and I can hurt each other. But so, this world is full of law. So why is Jesus just saying that? Isn't that just nearly impossible? So he's starting with this, you have heard long ago. You interpret it like this, but now I am the law. I'm bringing the new law of a heart. I'm bringing you to the new law of heart. This is looking at these things. It's not just the outcome of murder, but what is going on in your heart. So we're going to take a peek at these things. What is Jesus is talking about? Anyone who said to a brother or sister, Raka, is an answer to the court. And anyone who said you fool will be in danger of the fire and hell. Are these still the trendy swear word? We should really bring that word back. This is like the church mark for us. Like, you Raka. I feel like a Raka after Friday night. You know what rocket means? Anyone know what rocket means? Oh, goodness gracious. I feel like a son of a rocker. Rocker. Moros. Now, Chinese language is, you know, we speak Cantonese and Mandarin, but we know that, you know, deep down you have like Shanghainese, a lot of things. Raka is in Jesus' home language, is Aramea. When you call someone rocker, you really, it's just to be, to be honestly, it's call someone is empty head. There is a word in Chinese that's best describe it at all. It's calling someone baqqi. Baqqi is a word to saying that it's not that you don't have. It's, just, it's, it's worse than calling someone who's mentally disabled. It's saying that you have the ability to discern, but yet you choose to act like you are disabled. L simply to say, light is on, but no one is home or refuse to be home. It's not that you couldn't afford to get a Tesla, but you got to take a Tesla to a gas station. You do stuff like that. What kind of people do stuff like that? You do a lot of stuff. Empty heart. But what Jesus is saying, that what does that mean? Now, let me jump straight to the, the, the interpretations of what does that mean is, is that Jesus is saying that, you know, there's something going on when you're in your heart. When I saw that three girls sitting in front of in, in the car, pounding window, getting my attention and then pull their face back to show this Asian face. And they're laughing. Not only that, they pound on it. They look at it some more deep inside of my heart. I start reducing them. They still become nothing. In that quick process of milliseconds in my neurons is firing, I reduce them from a human being, from an image bearer of God to something it's worth killing. And I was killing them in my heart. You let me lose all of that car, I would have killed them. There would be no conversation. It would be just action. But Jesus said that, watch out. 
anger is a natural part of you, and God put that in you is not just to saying that just to trap you. God feel angry. We watch Jesus. He went to the temple. He flipped tables. But God is angry as the sin, but you are angry at the person. You use the rightful transgression, this right means of anger, into turning into a murderous deed. And he say, first, check yourself. Gospel is always like this. It's the first things you do is not just to set make right and wrong so black and white. It's first you internalize it. Jesus says, stop right there. I'm not saying that these people are right. They could be rockers and moron, but you could not reduce them to not seeing them as the image of God because, because we are all rockers and morals, and yet Jesus come for us. Yet Jesus come for us, not because we deserve anything, not that because we are done right, but that he came for us. There is problem in this. The problem is that we can't survive our own standard. We can't s survive our own standard. I'll give you my own example. Um, I feel racism was oppressed upon me, and I was angry. So recently, you know, the church is working really hard to bring Mandarin congregations on board to Sunday service. Okay, it's the truth. And you guys all know that somehow, I don't know why, in someone's wisdom, I inherited CN. And with the limited resource I have, trying to get these extra programs to go, just try to comprehend, to welcome it. I feel like deep down in my heart, there is a guideline, I confess. These are the Cantonese people, serve them first. And then whatever is left when there's nothing. And these are the outsider. And I'm looking at it. Am I just as racist as those people? I may not display like it, but in my heart, I know I examine it. If you judge yourself, or however your friend is, like girls is like, mm -mm, he's looking at my boyfriend. Have you ever looked at someone's boyfriend? Mm -mm, she, she's look, um, he's looking at my girlfriend. Have you looked at someone's girlfriend? If we measure the guiltiness of people that we are accusing in our heart, can we survive the same standard? But the Bible said it does not. In chapter 7, it said, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure to use, it will be measured to you. Can you do that? If every time you pull a rock or a morals, it's like, you know what? I was just sorry, man. I was having, I didn't get enough sleep or whatever it is. Oh, just simple things. If you turn in a homework late, you say, well, you know, I was there. I was working on it. Internet was down and this or that. And then turn around when your teacher couldn't give you back the gra your, 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 your grades uh, uh, on time. It's like, whoa, you're a teacher. We are guilty by our own standard. The Bible said that why don't you look at the speck and sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eyes. It's saying that you have a full eye infection. Your eyes crust up, up like pie and you're looking at a sister. Your eyeliner is off. The other one is higher than the other one. Are you like that? Maybe. They call you all the time that you're a hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eyes then you will see clearly. He asks you to internalize. He asks you to internalize this judgment, this process of reducing an other person's down. Because the consequences is that you are releasing hell. It's not that your anger will release hell. It's what your anger and judgment together, they built into these horrible concoctions. Therefore, if you are offering your gifts at the altar and there's a remember that someone, the brother or sister, is someone against you, leave your gifts there in front of the altar. First go and reconcile with them. Then come and offer your gift. 
first things you need to really look at it is that Jesus has come into our life when we are oblong doing rocker and mora stuff and we're pointing finger at each other saying that you're guilty I am not and we are punching each other and he said I am coming here to take this wrath of God in book of Roman is that the wrath of God has been satisfied it means that every record that can hold to accuse you has been taken away by his son's death the thing is when you are about to be angry and reduce someone to diminishing them into something that you can kill in your heart remember that that Jesus have done the wrath of satisfying God that every hypocrisy that you have forever and now and future has been wiped out rethink also to say that if you are truly a believer you really understand think about the Lord's prayer because he stopped your hell on you long time ago Moses have taken the the Israelite out of Egypt out of the wilderness and lend them to the lands of milk and honey, Hawaii. He's here to take the wilderness out of you. Otherwise, you will not be a rock that can flow out with honey. It's in the hard places. Rethink, internalize. And then through this, through this process, through this process, you will become salt and light. Think about how many people are coming to church or all injure and batter up. I was glad that Friday night the youth was there. I feel like I was the biggest fool watching kids for 30 minutes. Extinction of fire department came. Oh. But it is in the fellowship of the saint. These people all believe in the salvations of God that we can stand or have the face to face the consequences of it. More so so many people coming into this fellowship, into this life, into this Sunday worship has been kicked so hard. Things have been so wrong at them, being bullied, being ridiculed, being bullied. Or even just seeing the own mistake they made, the major they have choose to test it in the past. It comes in here, wanted a score and here is said that not because I am right and you are wrong and you are angry. It's that I will seek out those who has anger and I will bring peace. I will bring shalom to you. That's a deep process. This whole thing, this message is so loaded. It's not just to internalize yourself. It's just in the process. you internalizing and you can actually live out the grace as you have to be in this community. You have to do these things together. You have to grow together. Everyone coming in, they're all jacketed. It's not like we're coming here, you save, and suddenly you become a saint. This is what church is for. I'm going to switch gear for a little bit. I love the new current church music. A lot of people doesn't like it. I like church music. feels good. But do you ever recently that we have gone back to the old school song? That is such a soulful song. I love it. Thank you, Terrence. Thank you, Kareem. Honestly, oldies are goodies. Spare no punches to tell you where the honeys and the rock is at. 60 years ago, they were saying the same thing, but it is true. This is a place where you're supposed to come in to seek salvations. But today, church becomes something else. It has become a place that we have to entertain you. We have to come in to create this atmosphere, make sure the sound system is good, make sure that, that you are feeling good. People come into you, look into one of the Hillsong concerts, oh, Lord, <laughs> go to Bethel. And people will come to pray for you. Oh, I feel good. I feel clean. I can move on. And then they go home, go to this revival. I can feel the energy. Of course there is an energy, and I believe the energy is true. But it's that of a renewal in the relationship. 
But in here, church is calls for a deeper relationship, the renewal. It's when you come in angry, I seek you out. I seek to bring you peace at me. And when I am drink, my brother put their hands on me. It's like, I will lift you up. And then in here, everyone is everyone's is redundant systems. Everyone is here to fill a part of it, but you have to connect life. That's why you really have to just fellowship together. Because this is your lifeline. These people in here in your community is just not your buddy. Because eventually when you're down, when you're full of, when you're fully vulnerable, when you are not in the right of mind, someone needs to speak a spiritual truth to you. You look at every other community that you have. They either play you by games. They either you just fall into by hobby group. But if you think about it, everyone is there to agree with you. You build a community of people that agree with you. But in here, this is a community that can disagree with you, but yet we hug you. We love you. We want you to have this insurance, to have this stability, to have this spiritual wellness. So we have to look at this church system. Are we doing this? We are meant to transform. Exodus 19 is called that you're a kingdom, a priest, a holy nation. These are the work that you speak to the Israelite. You're holy because I have set you apart. In this dog-eat-dog world, devouring the weak, but yet we call you to have the strength to stand, but not with a fist, but with forgiveness and grace. Crazy. Call, call this process is called edification. You're coming in here with your rotten attitude, and we're coming in here with hugs. We are meant to do this, but we're not meant to come in as you forever to have a stinky attitude. You're coming to here is because the surrounding love. We call it the fruit of the Spirit. Later on, we will talk about different things, about lust, about divorce, about other aspects of the brokenness. But yet in here, all part of it is love, joy, peace, forbearance, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. It is to minister. But each of us is like a puzzle. We come with different areas of goodness. Sometimes Pastor Sam is probably low on self-control. And sometimes when you're very filled with goodness, very filled with love, we come here and just put together. But we have to connect this life. That's why it's important to go to fellowship. Thank you for putting up together senior trip. Thank you for teaching together. And thank you for the girls who come and teach at CM. But every bit of this, when you are applying your life, you are shining. You're learning to shine. And everyone else is also scraping around you, but then yet they're up polishing you. Only way you can understand this gospel is by immersion in this gospel. Church cannot be isolated. And it's not by your expectation. Sometimes when you come in and you expect this and that. But yet Paul said that in all his prayers in Ephesus from the Colossians, it's like there is logic beyond, you know, there's a spiritual knowledge of this. And this is the second part where we are nudging you to do devotions. Because all, all point, the Bible is coming into your soul, into your logic, and scraping all that stuff. You guys don't know what a barnacle looks like on, on the sea and the piers and gone fishing, boat. Barnacle are these little parasites that grows on the bottom of the boat, and they stick there, and they're jacketed. If you touch barnacle, you go to the tide pool without your shoes, they will cut you. Yet barnacle is some of the most stickiest substance there is. Still today, scientists would like to find out what the compound of the barnacle glue is, because if they find out, that is the best things. But yet you think about all this scar that you have, all this anger that you help and never really manifest, all this hurt, all this lust, all these things is subconsciously putting into you. Where do you do? Yet the gospel is the big scraper. It's made to be painful. But yet it's good for you. I flat out tell you we are brainwashing you, but we're not brainwashing you with lust. We're not brainwashing you with gender identity. We're brainwashing you with the sanctification, the purity of the water of Jesus Christ is through his blood, and it's good for you. You needed it. And we loved you. 
We don't want to do it harshly, but yet this process will cause you discomfort, but then this is what this place is for. So when you come in, you're getting sanctified. You sanctify the persons next to you, yet we are collections of sanctified people. We are the dialysis of this angry world. You come in here, this is the shalom. When he is here, when you are here submitting your life to him, this is the shalom of the world. I'll come to the last part. This is just settle matter quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way. Or your adversary might have handed you over to the judge and the judge might be handing you over to the officer and you might be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you pay the last penny. This is going to hurt. Instead of telling you all this psychological thing, I'll tell you a personal thing. I work in church for about 12 years. You work in church long enough, you got punched in the head because you call out people's sin. And as I was a new minister, sometimes things I could have do it more crafty, do it more polite. I even want to call out people more gentle. Sorry if I have hurt your feeling, but I need you to hear this. So in the years that I was ministering in this church, I somehow being hated by this family. And we were frictions. And sometimes it's just I don't think like there's anything I was wrong. But yet I was the head of it. But these guys just do things on their own. But yet I had to pick up the accountability part of it. But then we were just not liking it. And then I found out how much accusation is going on me, how much complaint is bringing on to me. I was like, these are not even what I was doing. You guys are doing it. Why do I have to bear the responsibility? And yeah, I was really mad at them. I was blamed for one time that, you know, the one of the kids is like late to, to lead worship. And it was supposed to start at 8. She hasn't even stopped tuning her guitar until 8.20. And yet, you know, dad told the past senior pastor that Sam was late to start. And they make a big fuss out of it. Not one time, not two times. Years. At the end, I was really hurt. And one night I was praying. I was at the peak of my anger. And I was laying down on the floor and praying. I was shaking. All I was praying was, Lord, you have to bring this bitter cup away from me. I can't stand it no more. I want to go to a different church. There's no love in this community, but nothing but accusations and pain. I can't do it here. Yet you find every bit of your love, you can't. And this is related to this. So I was praying, just focused, just hurt and grinding my teeth. By the way, this is why I need to go see a dentist. I have a lot of cracked teeth because I got upset and I grind my teeth. I was praying, I was praying, I was praying, and suddenly there was a fire inside of me. It's almost as like there is a new part of my memory that's been jogged. It wasn't even there. It's like so someone opened a subconscious part of my enemy, and I remember everything. I remember every email, every inconsistency they have. And here I am in my brain. I just built a case. I built a case to argue, to call upon God for these inconsistency, this hypocrisy they are living. Oh, I built a good case. I even tell God this is exactly why I want happen to them. I don't want forgiveness. I don't want shalom. I want righteousness. I want blood. But yet this voice is like, go seek God. And I keep praying. I forgot how long I was praying. I was praying till I was sweating. I was praying till I was hurt. I seek God into a laser focus. And this thing says, I bring it up to the Lord. Bring it up to him. He will give you vengeance. He said, vengeance is mine. And all these Bible verses is teaching me to go. And I went. And maybe this is an out-of-body experience, or maybe that I was just focused so hard that my brain hurt. I went somewhere. I actually got to went somewhere where I meet the holiness and the goodness of God, the purity and the sanctified presence of Him. I was about to drop this case. I have my starting argument. I have my case. I have my closing argument, and I want what for recompense. But when I enter into this place of pure goodness, I found out that 99% of my right didn't save me, but it's that 1% wrong, the way I reduced them, the way I held my anger, got in front of the presence of God, and I exploded. I realized this is what this thing is meant to do. See, that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. He can't kill you. He'll make your life miserable, and he's powerful. He'll make your world fall apart, and it's true. He can't kill you. The way he kills you is drag you into the holiness of God. 
and through the sanctified presence of His grace that you ask for grace and you can't give it. He puts you there and you will explode. That 1% will kill you and that's exactly what it is. So today is the place where we're coming to an end. I want to give you, I run over my time, but I just, I'm passionate about these things. There's a couple of things. You need to let go. You need to be filled. And you need to let him own it. How are you going to do that? Do you know that for a while I was a Buddhist? I walked away from the faith. And that's a different story. Before I was, a, I was a Buddhist and I was an atheist and I was a weird agnostic. But there's one thing I want to point out that Buddhists have this teaching is just when you want to be shalom, when you want to be in that shangala and that peace is to push every feeling there is out. Every inclination, every desire, when you're a void of that, no love, no care, no nothing, then you're there. I meditate long enough. That place is empty and it's terrifying. But God said that when you want to be with me, it's not that you want to be empty out. It's you have to be filled. So this empty and fill has to be a repetitive process. You empty out, you have to fill more. You empty out, you fill more. You empty out, you fill more. This is why we come to do this regularly. And at the end, you have to own this. Let me give you this in, in, in tactical term. In Hebrew 3, 12 to 5, it says, I see it, brothers and sisters, that none of you are a sinful, believing heart that turns away from the living God. See, when your heart turns away from God, it's already become sinful. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that get none of you being hardened by sin and deceitfulness. Read this. There's more. In this regular sense, is we're communion. We're not just taking the bread and the cup. We're taking that we're taking in the suffering. That means your suffering is my suffering. And my suffering, I can trust you with it. And daily communications and conversations and prayer, we know. That's why when you pray, you left out your heart. Pray for your fear. Pray for your, your desires. And then your friends would see that and he'll cover for you daily. So that you do not turn away because in your own prayer, you will pray to walk away. It's like, this is too much. But God said, no, I send you guys pair and pair. I make men and women together. When I call out the 782, I put them in pair. It is in the fail-safe system because our God is a triune God. We party together. So the church it is to be filled, to be empty. We kind of have to do together. Second part of it, you can just tell, is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Again, such things, there's no law. But you got to remember, not one of these is directly. It's like love is against hate. Forbearance is against lust. And self-control is against divorce. It's all part of this have to play into that suffering that you're going through. Sometimes your remedy is two park love and one park gentleness. And some park you need three parks self control and one park forbearance. He's giving you the formula, but then knowing that not all one of us can give you all nine fruit of it because we are all growing. So he put us in a community. More love over here, more self control over there, more forbearance over there, and there is a three park goodness. And being in here, you are exactly where you will receive help. You receive the goodness. And then vice versa. Everyone is everyone's remedy. And this is the point. Again, earlier when I tell you guys to pay attention, I'm sorry. I, I, I just really care for you to hear it. Is learn to speak things gently in the right time. I look upon myself why people are mad at me. Sometimes it's like I feel like I call people out instead of just want to call them out, want them to, to, to understand. It's just the way, I, I'm sorry, just my face. I think I make everyone angry. I shave sometimes. I'm angry. It's like, man, I don't like that guy's face. But you learn to do things in the right timing. You do to do, do a partner. That's why this is the partnership of it. And then most importantly, you see that stack this middle part. It's all the Holy Spirit. I can't do it because of me. I have to do it with the Holy Spirit. With me, is a sharp knife going there to trying to get my justice. But with him, he said, tone that down. He's like, use this as a righteousness. It's still blunt. It's still hurt. But he's meant to heal you. Lastly, again, I'll use my own example for it. Regarding the, the family, I, I struggle. And then until I have seek counsel with an older sister, 
And she, I was talking to her. I was like, why God not exercise injustice? They're walking around church like mafias. And her sister, after, you know, about an hour of ranting on and on and on and on, and then she comes to tell me this thing. She says, Sam, if you want God to exercise judgment, why are you sticking your head so close to them? Why are you watching everything they do? And this is what she taught me. It's like, let the Lord own all of this. Let him own your anger. Let him own your unrighteousness so you can be free. And when he moves, it's much more mightier, much more grander. The only reason why God hasn't exercised judgment is because your stupid head is sticking so close to it. Because if he does, he'll blow your head off. Vengeance is mine. And then lastly, look at Psalm 73. Talk about a man who understands this suffering, betrayal, be neglected, be being little. And at the end, isn't it kind of what Jesus did for us? Let this be a message of re just re rethink Jesus, not just anger. Where is it in your heart? Can he rule over your anger? Can he, your love be bigger than, 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 than the lust that you carry? All these little things you want is to make you feel comfortable, but it's that comfort is in me. It's eternal peace. I went over. Let me pray for you guys, and we're in close. Father God, I come before you as the angriest person. I am the guilty one, but Lord, I repent in front of you. I am a sinner in need of the repentance, Lord, and I am grateful. But I want to lead my brothers and sisters in this congregation and these young people in to be free from the accusations of hell. Lord, I pray that whoever have hurt them, Lord, you will be there for them. You will not let their heart and this pain of anguish be a point of anger only hurting himself. Lord, I ask you to give them a clear mind so you can see that. Sometimes the worst anger is the one that we have applied unto ourselves. Lord, I pray that you will lift us out. I pray for this community will be a community to deeply care for each other, not just come in here to play some games, sing a song, but they deeply, dearly connect it with each other. That whenever one is falling away, one is just suffering, being bind by the emotion, by the by the desire, Lord, you will use another to set them free. And then that go on and on and on. Lord, build the strength in this church. That in here we're not just a cross point church, but it's people, it's Caleb, it's Sam, it's Tara, it's Kareem. It's Nathan, it's Stephen, it's Benjamin. Lord, we pray that we be good brothers to each other. Lord, you not only want to empty out, you want to scrape the barnacle off of my soul, but replenish it with the nourishing water of your grace. Lord, we pray. I pray for these people. Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that you dwell here. You break down the barriers in our heart and make us in a new race of people as Jesus had meant to us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand and uh, sing a response song together.